Hello, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have you all here for our talk in the mechanics seminar of our graduate school in mathematics at the University of Brasilia. It is a great pleasure to have today Jocelyn Etienne from Grenoble, who is going to talk to us about uh, the mechanics of living cells. Before Jocelyn start, starts, I have to make a few announcements. So as you all know, these talks are open. Uh, everyone can watch them. So uh, please feel free to share the link of this talk. And uh, if you want to be on the mailing list, uh, the advertisement mailing list of these talks, please write your email down on the uh, chat, okay? And uh, you will start receiving the announcements for future talks. Uh, this talk is going to be recorded. It is actually being recorded right now. And if you don't want to have your voice or your face uh, publicly available on the internet, please switch off your mic and your camera now and interact with us via the chat, okay? Staying on the meeting is a consent uh, for publication of this video on our YouTube channel, okay? So without any further delay, I think uh, Jocelyn, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. It's very nice to see you again after such a long time. And I hope uh, we can uh, make these meetings more frequent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it's very nice that we bring new topics to our to discussion in our seminars. And I think it is going to be a, a very nice presentation. Jocelyn, thank you so much. You can start now. So, well... Thank you also for your invitation, Yuri. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be with you tonight, although at quite a distance. Um, so I'll be telling you, I'll, I'll be um, trying not to be too, uh, not, not to, to, to rush things and, uh, and to, to stay really on the, on the mechanics side for, for this talk. Um, and I think he, you, you'll find things which are uh, quite relevant to um, mechanics as uh, we understand it and as uh, um, we could discuss it with Yuri when, uh, when we were together in Cambridge. So let's, let's start. Let's start by having a look at uh, a living cell. So in, in a situation which is not very um, physiological, that's the situation in which we um, have been studying living cells for decades, um, which is when you culture the cells um, in a petri dish. So that's uh, the easiest way to image them in microscopy and so on. And so, of course, um, uh, biologists uh, can tell you that this is not physiological, but even though um, the material and the, the in protein interactions uh, within the cell um, to some degree are relevant to what the, mater the living material is uh, and how it's, it's behaved. So this is, uh, this is where we start because you, you need to start somewhere. And uh, also because uh, as you will see, those situations offer the possibility to do some mechanics, uh, whereas it remains difficult, although you, you can do things um, within an organism. So when those cells are uh, on a petri dish, you can you usually look at them from uh, the top uh, through the microscope, and this is the sort of things uh, that you can see using fluorescence microscopy, which means that uh, the proteins in these living cells are actually tagged with small fluorophores that uh, emit light in a given uh, color when you shine the, that, that color on them. And this allows to image specific structures. So the structure here that we look at is actin. Actin is well known for being very prominent in muscles. That's uh, mostly half of the content of a muscle, but you also find it in cells, um, in all sorts of cells, in, in actually uh, all of them, uh, all of the animal ones. And it forms... Um, meshworks, as you can see here, with uh, fibers which can be aligned or crisscrossed, depending on the, on the location where you look at. These uh, meshworks form actually what we call uh, a cortex. So this is really sitting at the periphery 
of the cell. So here the height of the cell is increased and you, you see it from the side. It's exaggerated in height. So you see that uh, the, the black region here is where the nucleus is. And then around that, uh, but mostly at the periphery, you have this uh, meshwork of actin, which is present. Um, and because this is uh, known to have a, a very strong mechanical role, um, you, uh, uh, that there is uh, more than a suspicion, and we actually know that the shape of the cell is uh, dictated by uh, the shape that the actomycin will take. The cell is, in addition, impermeable um, using, well, impermeable at short time scales, uh, because there is a um, lipidic bilayer which is attached um, to this uh, actin meshwork, so which is um, which envelopes the, the whole of that cell. Uh, so you also deduce that there is a, a pressure difference between the inside and the outside through this uh, impermeable membrane, and this is the, the force uh, applied by pressure is transmitted to the actin here because there is a continuous adhesion with this membrane. Okay. So this is for setting the landscape, but please feel free to, to, to ask in case anything was unclear in this very quick uh, overview of the things. And now I'll, I'll go to the dynamic properties of actin, because of course these cells are living and that they're not, um, even when they are apparently sitting still, um, there is uh, always uh, dynamics going on. So here, maybe you don't see, uh, because I've been told that the, the frame uh, rate of the uh, video transmission was low, um, but there is, a, there is a motion of this green material in this movie. You have the link in the chat so that you can download the movie and play it for yourself with a much better frame rate, I hope. So what you see is uh, this actin meshwork seen from the top, and the cell is actually forced to um, remain on a circular pattern. So this has been obtained by making the, um, the substrate all around uh, anti-adhesive. So the cell can adhere only on this circular pattern. It fills it when it initially spreads on it. And then it tries to extend further. You see uh, here these uh, small protrusions all around, but they can't attach to the substrate. And the result, um, as we see, is that um, the cell remains circular. It remains circular, so the shape is constant, but uh, you see a very uh, strong dynamics. So you see inward motion, centripetal motion of all the material. So there is uh, this um, orthoradial meshwork, so the, the, the circles are going inwards, and they seem to be pulling on, the, on those lines which arise from the periphery. So, okay, so what, what we have is um, a network of uh, filaments which are quite disordered in general. They are a little more ordered on this uh, circular pattern, but we have been forcing the geometry of the cell also, um, but that's really interesting. Um, we see that there is a strong role of adhesion because uh, where the cell doesn't adhere, uh, because of these uh, experimental constraints that we've put, putting anti-adhesive molecules uh, everywhere outside the circle, then the, the cell doesn't spread on those regions. We have uh, a flow, obviously, because we, we, we could uh, follow uh, this uh, fluorescence intensity going inwards, uh, going towards the center, and obviously it's uh, not divergence-free, um, so you should have accumulation of, the, of material in, uh, in the middle, but we see also that this looks like a, a permanent regime. You could see um, many, um, well, uh, during the course of the movie, you could see, of course, that the, uh, the, the, the total flow was equal to, the, uh, to, to what you see as the total material of the cell many times. So and it seems always to regenerate from the periphery. Um, so this is linked with uh, one first property uh, of uh, actomyosin uh, that I'll be talking about, that there is a constant um, depolymerization and repolymerization of the material. And uh, when in depolymerized state, so the, um, um, the monomers of actin, dimers actually, 
are uh, freely diffusing within the bulk of the cell. And actually, you can see that there is also fluorescence inside the cell, which is which doesn't appear to be organized in the same way as the periphery. And this is mostly these uh, fluorophores which are um, diffusing. And as they are diffusing, as they depolarize from the inside, it seems, they can diffuse and uh, be available to repolymerize at the outside, uh, providing this uh, permanent uh, fountain flow from the outside to the inside. All right, so this is how it is made possible in terms of mass conservation, but mm. we can say can that. I, yeah, sure. Can I, can I ask a quick question, just So, yeah, so when, when I play the movie here in my computer, what I see is that there is um, like um, a spiral rotation, right? Counterclockwise, that's what I see. And then there are some high intensity ah. green. And this high intensity green is made of, uh, I guess, fibers that get thickened or something like that. And they, they do not bend, but they tilt. So what is going on there? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, my son interrupted. It's, it's evening here. Um, um, okay, uh, so, all right. So that's the problem maybe having... So I, I wanted to show you only the beginning of the movie. Are you stopping be, beyond... Uh, 130. Okay, so that's okay. that's of course puzzling the the, the, the spiraling. Uh, so that was uh -huh. the topic of that paper, but uh, that's not my topic today. <laughs> okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, so that, that that spiraling was very intriguing. But um, because we, you know, the, even the um, um, the initial part of inward motion. So until uh, time 140 or 50 is already um, quite interesting. I, I was stopping there. And, and, and okay, okay, the rest okay. is more uh, predated. But, okay, so the, the, the darker green represents thicker filaments of actin. Uh, the, the brighter, you mean? Yeah, the brighter. The brighter, well, okay, so this is, um, it is uh, complicated to actually know what you see. And this is actually one problem in this, uh, in this field that we know what we do. So what they do is that um, genetically or through, well, through different ways, they um, make uh, available proteins which are fluorescent and which will bind to uh, actin. So we know that mostly when we see a fluorescence intensity signal, it is that there is a fluorophore which is in general bound to actin. So in general, the fluorescence intensity is proportional to the um, density, to the local density of actin. Actin, I see, I see, okay. okay. And actin is this um, polymer which forms long fibers, um, which uh, I'm about, whose dynamics I'm, I'm, I'm about to try to describe, yeah. Very good, very good. So Thank this you. is in the, mostly when you see bright green, um, you can expect this is uh, filaments uh, which are organized there. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, that's, uh, do feel free to, to continue interrupting. <laughs> so, yeah, so seen from the side and in, in, in a sketch, what the, the mechanical problem we have is, okay, we, we have a, a cell interacting in, with a, a frictional interaction with a, it's an adhesive interaction. I'll explain why uh, I call it frictional with a substrate. Um, so this cell has some shape, but we, we will ignore that shape. Um, this is uh, rather flat and we will consider it uh, to be a thin layer, um, which is in addition with the substrate. And within this thin layer, we have uh, a dynamics which is uh, going inwards in terms of velocity for this material, which is actin, and which I told you is the, um, the main stress bearing uh, structure within the cell. So, of course, there is one caveat here that um, the cell is composed of many different uh, proteins. There are other protein networks actually within it. So, you, you have um, mechanical elements which are in parallel. So, you have to, to, to make sure that uh, when you look at the deformation, the, the, the stress that corresponds to this deformation is indeed 
D1 of, of the material you, you're considering. But okay, um, I'm, uh, I'm asking you to um, believe me that um, here, this velocity is really uh, related to the state of stress within this material, um, which is actin. And so which has, uh, so we can define a, a tension, a stress tensor um, in the thin layer everywhere. And, um, and wonder about uh, what the rheology of that material may be and um, how it is that it is uh, flowing permanently inwards like that. All right, so yeah, just um, a word for Arthur who is doing inverse problems. One way uh, people have been uh, studying those traction forces that the cell will exert on the substrate is to have um, um, an elastic substrate instead of glass here. And they would track the deformations of this elastic substrate um, using beads, markers um, inside. And then um, starting from those, um, the displacement of those beads, uh, get the deformation and uh, pose an inverse problem of knowing what were the traction forces exerted on the substrate to obtain such deformations. So this is the one way uh, we are uh, obtaining information on the mechanics of cells, which is something otherwise quite difficult uh, because you, you can't really impose force uh, boundary conditions on those objects in general. So, all right, so let's, let's start doing some modeling of this, uh, of this material. So we will have, uh, we will define the density of this uh, green stuff, um, actin, uh, density rho, and we have a, a conservation law, but as I told you, it is um, depolarizing constantly. Uh, and we will assume it's depolarizing um, in the bulk at a constant rate, so minus gamma. And, um, because we see that uh, new material is being formed at the edges, we will assume that there is a flow of material uh, at the boundary, which is, um, which is uh, providing some uh, further material. So J has the dimensions of uh, a flux of rho, uh, and the, 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 the difference of, so rho times the, the difference of velocities at the boundary will be equal to this J. All right, so to, to simplify things, I will consider either uh, a segment like this, so an idealized 1D cell, and we can actually, instead of having um, a circle to make it spread with anti-adhesive molecules elsewhere, we can have, um, we can do that on a, a thin track. So this is not completely um, an idealization of a, of a physicist. Um, or we, we can also consider a circle in, in 2D here. Um, all right, so let's let's have a look at uh, those equations here. If you uh, look at the permanent regime where the local variations of rho are zero and the, the shape of the cell is fixed. Um, and if you choose some um, rheology of the cell that uh, says that uh, uh, an excess density generates um, a stress, so uh, a uh, a negative stress, which is uh, a pressure, um, and uh, otherwise a lower density generates a tension, then you can uh, solve this problem um, by saying also, okay, um, I didn't come back to it, whereas I had said I would, um, that these traction forces, we, we usually model them as viscous friction. So really a coefficient of friction times the velocity of the actin. The reason is that those traction forces are known to be exerted not, not through a viscous fluid as, uh, as viscous friction usually is, but through um, molecular interactions. So the molecules, receptors and ligands, so receptors uh, from the cell and ligands on the substrate bind um, they are being uh, challenged mechanically, so they're, they're being put under tension. So this is solid friction until then, and they uh, and then that they turn over. So you have just like you have constant depolarization of the actin, you also have those molecules binding and unbinding 
at a rate which may depend on the mechanical load, but in, in first approximation, you can simply assume it is constant. In that case, if you have binding um, deformation, elastic deformation, and then unbinding, you end up with something which looks like viscous friction. So this is an effective viscous friction that we are putting in here. Right, so if we solve um, this, uh, this problem here, so that there is not much of a surprise, um, you'll find that, um, so the velocity at the boundary is fixed by this uh, rate uh, J here, times the, the density at the boundary, but because we have no stress at the boundaries, um, if we, um, here we can even ignore the, oh, sorry. We can even ignore, uh, no, I don't have it. We can even ignore the um, viscous stresses and focus on, on those um, density related stress. So at the boundary rho would be equal to rho star because sigma n is equal to zero if I have just this term. Um, and in that case, I have a prescribed uh, velocity here, which is j over rho star, which is inwards. And then solving this problem in 1D gives me uh, quite easily um, uh, the, the shape here of a um, hyperbolic tangent for the velocity. So you have inward velocity, positive here and negative there, and a tension which is larger in the middle. And so this is all driven here by a depletion in density in the middle due to this rate of depolarization. Okay, so, so, so we can, so, so, yeah. A quick, a quick question, sure. so, so rho star is an equilibrium mm -hmm. density that will uh, the system will tend to in the absence of stress, external stress. So yeah, this is the one for which you, you, you don't have stress. Uh, this is not the equilibrium one of this reaction equation here. Mm -hmm. So you, you still depolarize it. So in terms of reaction, it's not the equilibrium, but that's the one which corresponds to no stress, yes. Mm, okay, That's the, okay. uh, the the kind of um, in in um, we, we we tend to do that uh, quite a lot because uh, the the system we study is actually controlling its own state. So there is there are ways to control things which are ideal. So maybe the biology has some input on, on that. Of course, this is a very cross mm -hmm. modeling, but this mm -hmm. is one way to to obtain what we want to see. But I'll show you in a second that you have other ways of obtaining the same, and they yeah, are so, so, also so, interesting. Yeah, I see. So, 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 uh, my my question is a, is a philosophical one. Mm -hmm. So, when you see uh, the Vietoric stress, now you see a sigma two mu d, we understand what's going on. The material is being sheared, and it responds to shear. It resists shear with a viscous stress, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so how, wh what is the physical origin behind this term that is related to rho? So, is it so? Is it is it is this term just representing what happens, or is there a mechanistic approach to derive that? So, the mechanistic approach is is to say that uh, when you have um, a large density, you'll have um, because you, you it is um, um, you 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 will end up having compressive stresses um, by elastic by simply elasticity of a you know a bit like a, a rho time uh, a rho to some power, giving you a pressure um, in a in a fluid. So the log comes oh, from the fact okay. that you do want keep, to keep things positive. That's all. Mm, mm, With the log, you can have. Um, so that's the simplest way you can uh, you can get this um, you know uh, uh, pressure under uh, uh, over density and tension under lower densities. I see. It comes from sort of a state equation that will mm -hmm. try to keep pressure. So. It is an isotropic term that is related to pressure. Basically, that's it. And that's it, your yeah. pressure and your pressure is linked via a state equation to rho. Yep, yeah, that's uh, that's that's I one see. way to to obtain. It. It's very I phenomenological, see. of course, uh, and see. there is no direct um, experimental possibility to to, to, to see how yeah, yeah, yeah. that works. But yeah, very good. Okay, thank you, thank you. 
So interestingly, using um, that, of course, so you can um, make the cell. Um, so because, OK, right, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping things. So we were looking at the statics of the cell here. Um, so it can um, stay in its, uh, in its place and have this permanent flow, or so this permanent inwards velocity, which is fed by depolarization and repolarization. Now, what we know from experiments is that those cells can also um, um, polarize, so start to have some in-plane polarity, some in-plane orientation, and start uh, moving along the substrate, crawling uh, along the substrate, uh, precisely because they, they are in, in frictional interaction with it. And uh, this has been uh, a question, of course, to, to model that. So one way you can model this uh, crawling uh, very simply with these ingredients is to desymmetrize this um, polymerization at the edge and to say it polymerizes only on one side. In that case, quite naturally, you, you will obtain um, a system that treadmills. So it's, it moves, um, it polymerizes forward here. There is some retrograde flow, uh, a flow going backwards in the rest, which is uh, driven by depolarization, but on the whole, you will get a progression of the um, mass center of this object. Although you are at uh, uh, low Reynolds, so there is uh, there is no inertia, so the um, the force balance is zero. But because uh, the monomers can travel freely without any mechanical cost within the object, this treadmilling does work. So you have exactly like the, the treadmill of um, of a tank, uh, so the tank trading is working because you have addition of the polymerized phase and the depolarized one is moving freely. So this is um, this does work, but this is not um, very surprising because you, you, you've put in the ingredients and then you have to say why it would polymerize only on one side. So this could happen because there has been a biological decision making uh, because there is a gradient of nutrients or, or whatever, which is driving the cell towards one side. But we also know that cells spontaneously polarize sometimes without any um, known gradient of properties. And the question was also, can we explain that um, with a, a purely mechanical model? And actually, uh, those people, so um, Carles Blanche Mercader and Casa de Munt, have shown that uh, this was possible with this very simple model, um, even without caring for eta, I think. Um, that's if you start with a circle and uh, this situation, you can have a shape instability, which then, um, so here you have a slight dissymmetry that you don't see of, uh, of those um, dotted line shapes. And this is actually moving forward um, permanently. So the energy is provided, of course, by the fact that you depromerize and repromerize. Um, and then a, a slight asymmetry in geometry is giving you a, a, a persistent motion of the uh, of the cell. Right, but um, as um, as Yuri was was pointing, actually, um, this is uh, quite a simplistic way to model the cell, and we'd like to know a little more. Um, about the, the, the rheology which is relating this uh, the stress and this velocity of the actin. And this is um, quite justified to, 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 to want to have a, a further look and, and looking at the microstructure of, of the cell in order to do that. Um, so the microstructure is really the one of um, a, a cross-linked gel which has uh, this property of turnover, but that's that's not all. So if you have a crosslink gel, the uh, and and the crosslinkers um, stay in place, and you assume that any affine deformation will be transmitted to the um, to this meshwork, you can quite easily uh, reobtain the elastic solid um, relation here of uh, relating uh, sigma and the. Uh, uh, symmetric part of the gradient of velocities. And then what had been done for um, transient crosslinks in, in rubber-like materials, so crosslinks that pop off 
and will come back again in the network at a, a fixed rate. Um, is simply to assume that, so you you, you write the um, Fokker-Planck equation for that, you remove that at a fixed rate and you reconnect them um, at the same rate, but in a relaxed configuration. And through that, you have relaxa elastic relaxation within the material. And what you obtain with this sort of model is uh, a viscoelastic liquid model, um, like the Maxwell um, viscoelastic. Um, um, constitutive equation that you have here. So you, you simply obtain that through this turnover there. And this can explain why my cross-linked network actually behaves um, like a viscous fluid. But uh, there is an extra active ingredient I haven't talked about yet, which is myosin. So myosin is also a molecule which is um, very much present in muscles. Um, which is able to cross-link actin filaments, like the other cross-linkers, but uh, through injection of uh, ATP energy, so the, um, the energy that, that is present within the cells, can perform a, a walk along the actin filaments. This is known to provide um, the, the, the capacity of muscles to contract. So this has a contractility effect. And actually in muscles, what it makes is that it can slide actin filaments um, relative to one another. Here in the cell, we, we don't have the same organization as in uh, muscles. It's, um, it's a very messy network, but still you can find that if you add this, uh, these walks of um, the myosin on the filaments, you find that there is um, a term, so a constant um, uh, a, a term which, which may be oriented towards um, the direction of the filaments and gives you uh, a sort of negative pressure within the material. So a sort of pre-stress um, that will always put the material in tension. So with, with this ingredient, if you, if you try to figure out what, how this material behaves, with this sigma A term here, coming from the myosin, if you have Dirichlet-Bahn boundary conditions, then you find uh, that in the permanent regime, you feel, of course, this stress at the boundaries. So it's pulling against the boundaries. If you have uh, boundaries that uh, are just uh, Neumann boundary conditions, so permeable for, for fluids, but um, uh, bearing no force, then you will have a collapse of the material at a rate which is dictated by sigma A and uh, the viscosity of this effective fluid-like material due to the turnover of the other crosslinks. And finally, um, if you have um, a spring-like, so a, a mixed boundary condition uh, here, you can solve um, for the equilibrium. And you'll find that, of course, if um, this, um, this stiffness here is smaller than uh, a threshold, then sigma A is still large enough to collapse the material and obtain a zero height. Whereas if you are beyond this stiffness, you have um, a length which emerges, um, which is a balance between the stress developed here by this spring and sigma A. Okay, um, so this is uh, this is an already an interesting material. It mimics a little what, uh, what the spring would do in series with uh, another spring. You have uh, here a sort of emerging uh, stiffness here. And what is interesting is that if you add on top of that the capability of um, polymerizing at the boundaries and depolymerizing in the bulk, then you will reobtain something which looks much more like an actual spring, and this is a comparison actually with experiments. I think I'm missing one slide here. But, um, so if you add this aspect that uh, you have this treadmilling, so you have um, a polymerization at the boundaries in addition, and that the um, mass balance is uh, respected because you have depolymerization in the middle of the cell, 
then you obtain that um, for the low external stiffness, you have a balance between um, the rate at which you are contracting and the rate at which you are expanding at the edges. So you find a permanent regime of uh, a height with, uh, with this inward flow. And for very large stiffness of the exterior, you find that, um, again, as before, the cell doesn't, cannot deform, but um, exerts some force on, uh, on your apparatus, so on the uh, boundary conditions. So here I'm showing an, an experiment that was done by um, Ette Fasnacius in Paris, and where we do as close as possible, um, we produce as close as possible this, uh, this sort of, uh, of experiment, where we, of course, have a, a 3D uh, behavior. But the, again, we have a cortex, which is very thin at the periphery of the cell, which is pulling on those plates, and which is reaching some equilibrium height um, in the long term here. And this is where the data comes from uh, on this plot. OK, so if we go back to our model, we have this um, contractility term, sigma a, which is coming from the myosin. And we may still have a contribution from um, the density. And probably these two are, uh, are usually combined in, um, in effects that we're seeing. And of course, also tuned by a lot of uh, biological effects. Now, I. I think I'm, um, I'll be uh, slightly longer than I had planned, but if you, if I can speak for one more quarter of an hour, Yuri, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, carry on, carry yeah. on, go ahead. Okay, so what, um, what I wanted to show you is going back to the, to the 1D setting and showing you um, whether this um, object, which I've, I've shown you in, in 2D through a shape instability, it could start moving. Um, but recently, we found that um, even without this uh, two-dimensional instability, we could have um, an interesting uh, self-polarization, symmetry breaking um, uh, possibility. Let's get that. When the substrate is uh, itself um, deformable. So I've told you we, we use elastic substrates um, first because uh, that allows to record the deformations in the substrate and uh, measure forces exerted by the cell, but also because in, uh, in physiological conditions, um, cells in, in the organism uh, are not facing uh, substrate as hard as glass. At most, it's bone, but mostly they are in tissues which have uh, a finite elasticity and an elasticity which is of the same order of magnitude as the elasticity of cells themselves. Because, of course, the organism is mostly made of cells and um, extracellular matrix, which is a, a gel generated by cells. So it is interesting to consider these substrates. What it changes in the model is that you now have um, possibly displacements uh, from uh, the substrate here. And if the loading evolves in time, these displacements have a time derivative, which will be the velocity of the substrate. So the friction law is now affected by this velocity of the substrate. Um, so for, for this problem, I'll, I'll remove the sigma a term I was just telling you about. I'll use only, again, this um, log of the density term. And now we, we will be considering this. Um, so of course, if the cell is immobile, um, Vs being the derivative of the, uh, of the deformation of the substrate. So if the substrate is only deformed by the cell itself, Vs will be 0, and we are back at the previous case. But as soon as the cell is moving, the load applied on the substrate moves. And then um, the, um, the deformation of the substrate is changing in time because it's shifting. And so Vs will be non-zero. So OK, so the hope is to see whether the cell, by generating a deformation in the substrate, 
can then feel that deformation and uh, move because of it. But um, I've already told you that the um, trivial solution of uh, having the cell static would work because this is this is just the previous case. So our only hope is that the cell is actually surfing on, on, on that elastic deformation, in a sort of elastic wave that it's uh, itself creating. So we were wondering whether this was possible at all, that you have an object sitting on, a, on an elastic substrate, there is an elastic wave in that substrate, and the object moves along with that wave. So that was our, our first question. If you put a cell which is interacting with the substrate, and you deform the substrate not due to cell to the, to the forces exerted by cell, but due to, for instance, an external field like a magnet, and you have magnetic particles in the substrate, can you manage to create a, an elastic wave that will entrain the cell along with it? Um, so we will be following, so let's, let's say that we are moving this magnet with the velocity VE, and we will be in the frame of this magnet. Um, we can calculate the deformation of the substrate um, with um, a plain strain kernel here. So that's a sort of a green kernel um, proportional to the force exerted by the magnet. And then the calculate the deformation um, in, the, in the substrate. Um, so this deformation in the frame of the magnet um, will be will appear to be the deformation at the, sorry, the velocity of the substrate, will appear to be the, this deformation multiplied by VE because we are in a moving frame here. So we have the advection of those uh, deformations. And now what we are asking is whether the, um, here we, we can have some drag on, uh, on, the, on the cell, on this object, and we have a friction force, does the resultant of this friction force, is it able to compensate for some drag so that you move the cell? So um, this uh, and, and uh, our cell is doing this treadmilling motion. So we have always inward motion, so minus VPY, so it's always moving inwards. And it's moving with uh, this velocity C dot. Surfing is possible uh, as long as you remain um, on the top of the wave. So you need C dot to be equal to the velocity of the magnet, exactly. So what we need to find is um, uh, a solution. So we have to find some deformation, some elastic wave, which is strong enough so that it entrains the cell so it, it can compensate for a drag coefficient here so that C dot is equal to VE. So this is um, not obvious and not possible in general because epsilon s needs to be larger than minus one. If you have epsilon s epsilon smaller than minus one, so, you have so, self so interpenetration. The, yes. The variable, the variable that you want to find on this integral condition is epsilon s. Uh, just yeah, for, for this example, that's that's the case. That's how you mm -hmm. deform the substrate with the magnet. Then you can uh, you can take a realistic realistic shape of this of the force of the magnet and, and deduce it. But in the end, what you what you are tuning is the is the elastic wave. Yes, okay, okay. And so you find that um, the condition you, you you need to have is this friction. This if this friction is is linear, there is no hope because epsilon s will be need will need to be smaller than minus one in places. And this is not admissible. There is self-interpenetration of matter in that case. But if zeta, the, the, the friction law, is not linear, so if you have slippage for very large velocity difference between substrate and cell, then this is becoming to be possible. And you have what we've called a um, surfing condition. If you have uh, a nonlinear friction, so if the friction, as is found experimentally, decreases when you have large speeds, then you have a condition which allows you to have 
um, in places, contributions of the of the friction which are lower, and you you can manage to find such a wave, and you can advect your cell with the velocity of the magnet, provided that it does treadmill. So you need also this VP, the, the, the speed at which you add new material at the edges and makes it treadmill to be um, to be non-zero. In that case, it, it could work. So someone could surf on an elastic wave if they have um, a, a treadmilling surf. Now, the question is, can we do that without the magnet? Can the cell itself exert a force on the substrate? And can this um, force deform the substrate? And can this system be unstable in the sense that it would spontaneously polarize and, and go either way? And so this is work that we, we've done recently with uh, Pierre Rechaud. It's now an archive. And we find that, yes, indeed. Um, if um, so, now the, the the force exerted on the substrate is exerted by the cell. It deform it deforms the substrate. If the cell doesn't move, that results in um, a, a zero velocity of the substrate because the velocity of the substrate is proportional to the velocity of the cell of the load exerted on it times the deformation of the substrate. But um, if the cell moves at a, a velocity v then there is uh, a non-zero Vs here. And what we find solving this problem uh, for, the, for the cell is that, indeed, there is um, a critical compliance of the substrate, beyond which you find that you, you can have, um, you, you can solve uh, this problem with a non-trivial solution. And actually, there is a bifurcation occurring at um, a critical softness of the substrate, so a critical theta with the um, elasticity of the substrate is on the denominator here, and you have the, 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 the treadmilling speed of the cell uh, on the numerator. And so beyond this theta, the cell will choose either way, so it will randomly go left or right, positive or negative velocity, and the forces it exerts on the substrate are disymmetrized. And you have um, a motion which is which is uh, of uh, a finite magnitude compared to the velocity of the of the treadmilling that we, you've put in. So this was quite some fun. There was some um, so yeah, really the, the the reason why this is working is that this is um, a, a quite well known instability in mechanics that the follower load instability where the, the load is actually following the motions of the object which is being deformed. So the classical example is the um, uh, watering hose, where the, uh, the force exerted at the end is following the deformations of the hose itself, giving nice instabilities. Here you have this happening through the fact that the cell imposes the deformation and uh, may be um, advected. OK, we, we have, on uh, again, this problem of having non-admissible deformations, which can be solved by using either uh, a nonlinear friction or doing a nonlinear non uh, elasticity in, in the substrate. But uh, I think I have been long enough. And uh, anyway, this is more technical than, uh, than really something that can present um, in this seminar. So with this, I'll just wrap up that um, this is so this influence of um, a, a finite stiffness of the substrate is not just anecdotal. It's not just a way to have fun with um, a complicated couple of problems. Um, it can also be important um, physiologically. Uh, first, because um, so in, in the experiments, we already know that um, cells which are um, moving, which are um, um, asymmetric and which are polymerizing at, at one end, for instance, as I was explaining earlier, will move um, at a velocity that depends on the stiffness of the substrate. And uh, the effect that we, we document here by the interaction through 
the, um, the modulation of the friction force by this Vs can modulate the speed of the cell. And this is something that we, we've been working on in the thesis of Haidt and Shelley here. And then also because um, having cells which um, are actually sensitive to the mechanics of the exterior um, can be important um, in morphogenesis in general, so in the um, evolution of the shape of an organism. Um, we know that cells can follow gradients of uh, stiffness, for instance, that um, they can be guided by them in, uh, in, in the building of an organism. So studying this sort of uh, interaction and knowing what are the purely mechanical laws that can be exploited uh, by cells um, is um, an interesting uh, thing to do because then you, you can know when looking at a biological condition um, what may be coming from mechanics and where you need to look for a, a much more uh, biological explanation. And, and so this is my illustration here is a developing fish uh, where you see a lot of cells first dividing and then um, finding their way to organize, to self-organize into an organism. Thanks to the genetic program, but also thanks to mechanical sensing and, uh, and um, mechanical interactions. Thank you. I'm ready for questions and sorry about uh, the increased speed in the, in the course no. of the seminar. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Very, very nice, very interesting uh, at seminar uh, presentation. So we are now open for questions, comments, discussions. Uh, if you want to, 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 to say something, ask something, please just open your mic and ask questions or raise your hand, OK? So um, I will probably start asking one question. So when you can you can you go back a few slides and show mm -hmm, sure. the uh, the uh, boundary motion that you solved that you found you superposed several boundaries uh, that from circle it evolved to other shapes can you go back a little bit it's ah okay yeah so this was uh, th this is the, the work of uh, Blanche Mercader yeah that, that, this, one, this one? that one yeah 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 so so how so in that case, your initial condition is a perfect circle. Yeah. And I assume that a perfect circle has, let's say, homogeneous, if not homogeneous, probably not the best word, uniform uh, boundary conditions uh, along theta, along the angle. So your, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the solution that you found uh, shows that there is a deformation, some sort of asymmetry that generates an ellipsoidal shape that also generates some sort of necking of the solution. Where does yeah, that come from? Uh, this is, um, again, well, so this is, uh, this is not my work, but this is, um, just as in the case of the, of the surfing, this is a bifurcation which occurs for um, a sufficient, so this, uh, this time the, the uh, the threshold is on the, the rate of depolarization uh, uh -huh. on the inside. So beyond uh, some uh, critical value, you have this um, shape instability which can occur. So here the interplay, the, the, the nonlinearity comes from the fact that if, uh, if you're narrower in any place, then you will increase this, uh, you, you, you'll neck, uh, as you were saying, mm -hmm. um, and, and there is and evolve towards this shape, which is still asymmetrical, and so which is uh, which continues moving. I see. I see. I see. Okay. So the the, the, the so there is uh, the solution of the equations generate an asymmetry, even if you have say zero force acting on the boundaries. So it's an internal yeah. thing that comes from the source term in the uh, uh, row equation. Yes, yeah, yeah. This is really uh, a dynamic instability. Okay, all right, all right, very good. Uh, do we have more questions? Do we have comments? Okay, I have another comment on another question, actually. Ah, oh, we hang on, we have. Um, uh, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I think. Mm -hmm. we have yeah, I, I see one in the, in the chat. Yeah, in the um, chat. Let's, let's go for that one. 
By using a simpler yeah. model, you're probably discarding some biologically important mechanisms involved in this process. What are they and how important do you judge they are for actually obtaining biological information from the model? So that there are very many <laughs> first, mm -hmm. um, of course. Um, and so the so I, I, I can't really possibly list them, but there are many. Uh, so for instance, in the if we're talking about um, polarization, um, of course, there is a lot of uh, sensing its environment which which is taking place. And then there is a, a cascade of uh, reactions um, which may take place sometimes with um, more or less processing uh, of the um, of, of the information. So really, uh, cells are really um, complex um, automatons, uh, the most complex we, we know, I guess, um, of an autonomous uh, automaton of that size. Um, but um, so what, really what, what, what we are trying to do is not, uh, is probably not to um, inform on the, the wealth of biological behaviors that, that you can have, but knowing what are the um, the key mechanisms which are already built in with what we know for sure is there, there is. Um, so for instance, you can always refine things by saying that rho star or k or all of the possible constants are regulated by a cascade of reactions. Um, this is this and this is true, um, but if you don't know what are the basic uh, motions that you obtain just from uh, the um, the baseline, the, the the constant part in that, then you cannot possibly appreciate how things are being regulated to obtain um, other emergent behaviors. So it's 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 needed to simplify first in order to address the complexity, I guess, as as usual. Mm. Um, I admit that um, because of the sheer complexity of the of the thing, we have to cut uh, even uh, even more strongly in that. But one difficulty also that uh, maybe is is surprising when you come from outside this field is that, contrary to engineering, we cannot um, no experimentalist knows how to make a simplified system. So taking just actin and myosin from uh, from a cell and putting that in a vesicle doesn't give the behaviors we are seeing. There is mm. a lot of um, regulation which is necessary and, and no one yet has managed to purify uh, ingredients and then put them back to obtain emergent behaviors which are similar to, to those uh, of the cell. So this is an endeavor that, that many people uh, are uh, working on. So maybe someday. Um, but so far, the, the, the limitation is that also because of that, you cannot really build um, a system from scratch and, and putting all the ingredients which are present there. You can do, uh, you know, um, ideal gas um, experiments with cells because you, you don't get uh, the basic laws you're looking for mm. experimentally. Yeah. That's the complexity of life, right? Uh, <laughs> Indeed, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. Uh, any other question? I, I think I'll ask my question and then people can... Go uh, ahead, go ahead. I uh, wanted to ahead. ask a question, go ahead. just a follow-up. But couldn't you find a simpler cell with like uh, like less evolved cell to work on? So th th there are um, even uh, so th there are simple models. So for instance, um, cells doing things similar to that um, are not. Uh, you you can do that even with things which uh, have no nucleus. So th there is a sort of cell called curatocyte, and they are um, very good at crawling. So they are um, a favorite with uh, experimentalists uh, studying this. And those cells, it has been shown that you can even manage to, um, not really to cut, but to get some fragment of the cell um, separated from it. So still enclosed in the membrane and containing actin, myosin, and other molecules, 
undetermined because you, you have just cut a bit. And this can crawl for quite some time. Um, so undergo really the motion we, we, we're looking for in these uh, studies. But still, this is um, the soup you have in there, even though there is no nucleus, so there is no generation of new proteins. Um, so this, um, the molecular content is um, not completely uh, characterized and attempt to reproduce that by having a vesicle, put in actin, myosin, other crosslinkers, enzymes, and so on. So far, no one has succeeded to obtain something that can consistently crawl for, um, you know, uh, a, a few microns, even, uh, even uh, a quarter or a tenth of the object size. Right. Thank so, you. yeah, so it's, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> mm. Okay, thank you, Arthur. So I have a question, Josela. Can you move mm -hmm. forward a little bit uh, on sure. the uh, scheme that you have to find the right elasticity to get the cell moving? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any further... So this is right. this is when it's driven by the magnet, and then there is and the, the next uh, one. Yeah, so it can be either, but I think the last one, the second one, where you have the uh, the um, the uh, the self propelling cell. So what is the numerical scheme that you impose there? So you need to find f mm -hmm. such that the integral is positive. And such yep. that C dot satisfies the velocity that comes from the uh, continuum equations. Is that correct? Yes, that, that's it. So in, in the end, you have, uh, so here, this is, this is F. So this, this is the, the force that the cell exerts here. Mm -hmm. the, the point was force, and you integrate it over the interval, and actually we, we are taking uh, a zero drag force. Um, it's um, so that that means we, we are making it 10 to zero. OK, but in those conditions, that's the minimum you, you, you can have in order to, to hope to have an, an object which is moving. Mm -hmm. So you have to have uh, so you, the, the resultant of those force need to be zero. Mm -hmm. And um, in the end, you only have so you have to solve for F and V. Um, F being, so did I put it? Okay, yeah, I put it here. In the end, that's um, that's how you you rewrite the, the problem. You non-dimensionalize, and you 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 have this um, equation where F appears here, but also there because the deformation of the substrates depends now okay. on the force exerted by the cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you find it actually. Here, so this is the, uh, the, the, the the kernel, the derivative of the of the elastic kernel, uh, one of a y minus y dash, and the force here. Mm -hmm. This is being advected by v because this is the fact that my um, time derivative is transformed into um, a material derivative because I'm, I'm moving along with v. My frame mm -hmm. is moving with v. Um, and then, so this uh, this force exerted by the cell needs to be. So this is the retrograde flow of the cell, non-dimensionalized. Mm -hmm. So you have the force is equal to the, the the part of the velocity that comes from the cell minus the velocity of the substrate. So this is my zeta v minus v s, which is here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this needs to integrate to zero. So I need to find. Uh, um, a scalar v using this scalar equation and uh, a field f on uh, on the segment minus one one, which solves that. And so this is um, this is what we are solving. And actually, Pierre, who is quite um, a geek at um, analytical uh, resolution, uh, has been able to find a, a technique to solve that analytically. All right. So using uh, Jacobi polynomials. And a uh, oh. 1960s uh, paper from the um, Soviet Academy of Science. Very good. The Russians have so, always done it before, right? 
<laughs> they have. Well, they, they haven't looked at cell surfing for, for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> All right. But so, and, and this does work because this is a, um, a polynomial here, um, a polynomial function. So you can project on the Jacobi basis. And that's, um, so that's, that's easy. You have to just to have to focus on the, the first two uh, function, Jacobi functions. Oh, very nice, very nice. Well, this is easy once Pierre has done it, but uh, yeah, 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 I, did, I, did. <laughs> I wouldn't have attempted it myself. <laughs> I would have tried numerically and just just tried to discretize things, integrate, yeah. and you do an iterative scheme. But yeah, it's you, you, always you, nice to try and find analytical solutions. Yeah, yeah. So numerically, he could solve the uh, dynamics also. So you you see that there is actually uh, interesting dynamics towards uh, the um, this uh, traveling wave uh, solution when you are beyond uh, the, the critical theta. Mm -hmm. So it seems that really uh, the, the, the cell goes mad at some time. So there, there, there are much larger velocities in the mm. very oscillatory. And we, we haven't understood why yet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So here, actually, you have the, the solution that he's found using these Jacobi functions. So you see that. I see. Uh, it's this, still uh, implicit. It's still implicit, but it's an analytical. Uh, it's, it's only implicit for the velocity. So that's that's quite simple. Oh. So you you have the instability comes beyond theta equals two, because mm -hmm. this is the the shape you have, two two pi v equal to arctan theta pi v. So you you have three solutions to I that see. if theta is larger than uh, than two. Than two, I see. I see. But then the, you have explicitly the force, and then you can calculate numerically. Uh, I think. I think it's numerical because you no no you have an explicit formulation I'm, I'm not sure anymore, but you you mm -hmm. can calculate u and epsilon from the from the force here. Mm. Very good, very good. Do we have more questions, comments? Okay, all right. I think we've discussed this uh, a lot. Uh, Jocelyn, thank you so much for your time, for preparing this very nice talk, for introducing us to this uh, new topic that uh, seems extremely interesting, links elasticity with biology, with hardcore mathematical modeling, and very nice methods to find analytical solutions of uh, uh, model toy problems that uh, can only reveal how complicated life can be, right? How how um, uh, uh, unaware of things that are happen at the uh, cell scale we still are, right? But nevertheless, we still mm -hmm. can explain few things, right? Motion and uh, uh, very nice uh, basic principles that we all love to see when we find these equations explain this is what's happening or a very nice graph showing the motion or the results that we expect. So this is uh, very nice and I'm very happy uh, that you uh, um, were here to give this talk to us tonight, or this afternoon here in Brasilia. Uh, Jocelyn, would you like to say a few words before we switch off? Well, uh, just saying thank you, and uh, hopefully I hear from some of you um, in in some time. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I will uh, stop. Uh, if anyone has no, if no one has no other questions, I will stop recording now.